Would you take your Bibles tonight, open to 1 Kings chapter 6. We are in a study through First and Second Kings, and tonight I want to talk about a house for God's name. We're going to be looking at chapter 6 tonight. And while you find that, have you ever heard of the Burj Khalifa? That is a, the tallest building in the world. It is located in Dubai. And according to the building's website, this is what they say. They say more than just the world's tallest building... Burj Khalifa is an unprecedented example of international cooperation, a symbolic beacon of progress, and an emblem of the new, dynamic, and prosperous Middle East. So as you can tell from that summary there, um, the Burj Khalifa is not just a building, it is a message. They're getting a message out uh, in that building. Now, and what they're saying is the significance of this building it communicates something to all of the rest of the world. Now, this is something that we've seen in history, is it not? That buildings that are built throughout history are more than just buildings, but they're intended to communicate a message, a very specific message to people that may see it. This goes all the way back to the Tower of Babel uh, in, the, in the Genesis chapter 11. There was a specific message behind the building of that tower. And again, we could say through history, Buildings attract attention and they give a message. Many of the greatest leaders in the world have built buildings that bear their name. Now, this was true in Solomon's day as well. All of the surrounding nations had temples that were dedicated to their pagan gods. But Yahweh, the God of Israel, he was, just, he was no local deity to be sure. He was the true and the living God, the real God. He was the maker and is the maker and sustainer of all all things, the ruler of every nation, including the nation of Israel, and yet there was no building built for his name at that time. It was time for God to have a building built for his name and for his glory. And this is why Solomon is now on the scene. This is the purpose for Solomon's life. This is really the purpose. In fact, there's only one that's higher than that, and that is beyond the building, Solomon as a leader is to lead the nation of Israel to obey the covenant they made with God and to be obedient to God. But second to that, the great purpose for Solomon's life was to build a house for God's name. That was his purpose. Now, we all have a special purpose in calling. What is your purpose? Why are you a part of God's kingdom? Have you ever thought about that? Have you ever asked yourself that question? What is my purpose? What is my calling? Is it to be a mom, to be a missionary, to be a medical doctor, uh, to be a minister or a mechanic? Whatever it is, God has a purpose for you, and we have to figure out that purpose, why God brought us here, and how we do that, uh, fulfill that purpose for the glory of God. Now, when I was a teenager growing up here at Grace, God made clear to me the purpose for me was to preach the word. I didn't know that I would be the pastor here at Grace, but I knew that I wanted to preach God's word. And under the ministry of our founding pastor, Pastor Johnson, uh, God laid that on my heart. And since that time, God has affirmed that. And so my life has been directed by that one major purpose. Every decision in my life revolves around that one thing of fulfilling that purpose that God has for me in my life. And so therefore, since I know that this is my calling, I know that this is my purpose, I want to make sure that I do that with excellence for the glory of God. And this is what we learn from our text here. I would say the big idea here in this particular chapter is understanding our special purpose and calling shapes not only what we do, but also the manner in which we do it. Again, Solomon understood that God brought him to the throne of Israel at that particular time, to build a house for his name. In fact, look in chapter 5. Look down at verse number 3. This is Solomon speaking here, and uh, actually drop down to verse 4. But now the Lord my God hath given me rest on every side, so that there is neither adversary nor evil occurrent. And behold, I purpose to build a house under the name of the Lord my God, as the Lord spake unto David my father, saying, Thy son whom I will set, Upon thy throne in thy room, he shall build a house unto my name. So Solomon understood very clearly why God put him on the throne, and it was God who did it. It was for the purpose of Solomon building this temple for 
God's glory. So Solomon wanted to build the best temple he could. He wanted to honor God's name. Now, I want to say that as as God's people, that is our highest privilege. That is our highest calling, that we can honor God's name. So do you honor God's name in the way that you live your life? Do you honor his name in the excellent manner in which you serve him? Do you honor his name by your faithfulness to serve him and your faithfulness to worship? Again, this is our greatest calling. Remember what Jesus taught his disciples when he taught them to pray, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And that word hallowed is a a, a verb. It's not necessarily a prayer request. It's a command that God's name be hallowed, that God's name be treated with honor, that God's name be made treated with holiness, you see, and honor. In fact, the word there, hallowed, is uh, hegaizo, which where we get our word to set apart, to treat as holy. So this is the very first thing that Jesus tells his disciples to do is to make sure that you treat God's name holy, that you honor God's name in the way that you live your life and the way that you fulfill your purpose and your calling. Now, with all that, I want to show you from our passage four principles that we need to apply in our life as we serve and fulfill God's purpose. Here's the first one. Number one, I would say get in harmony with the hand of providence. Look at verse number one of chapter six. And it came to pass in the 480th year after the children of Israel were come out of the land of Egypt, in the fourth year of Solomon's reign over Israel, in the month Ziv, which is the second month that he began to build the house of the Lord. Now, this might not look like it on the surface, but this is one of the most important verses in the Old Testament. And you can look at this verse three ways. First of all, you can look at this verse chronologically. You see, verse 1 kind of furnishes a biblical uh, chronology uh, of this period because it tells us specifically the time when the children of Israel left Egypt. Uh, 480 years from the time that Solomon began to build this temple is when the children of Israel left in the Exodus. Now, this is an important date. In fact, it's an important date in archaeology. I know many of you know that I go over to Israel with uh, ABR, and I do some some archaeology. And and very important to us is be able to date things at the right time. But in order to do that, you have to make sure that the dates line up with what the Bible says. And this this is a very good uh, specific date, and it's used because it tells us that the Exodus happened at around 1446 B.C. If Solomon began to build the temple... In his fourth year of his reign, like it says, that would be 966 B.C. If you go back 480 years, you come to 1446 B.C., which is an early date of the Exodus. Now, the reason that's important, I don't want to give you too much here and bore you tonight, but the reason that's important is because there's a battle between those who believe the Bible and are conservative and those who are liberal and don't believe the Bible has any historical reliability. Liberals will say, well, no, the, the date of the Exodus was much later. It was in 1230 B.C., not 1446, and it was under the, the pharaoh of the Exodus was Ramses. In fact, all the movies that you see, you know, will have Ramses as the pharaoh of the Exodus, and that supports more of a liberal view of the Bible, which doesn't really treat the Bible as it being historically accurate. But the real pharaoh of the Exodus was Amenhotep II. Uh, the pharaoh of the oppression was Tud Moses, because that goes all the way back to 1446 B.C. So this is a very important date chronologically, but also it's a very important date theologically. It was clear from this that what the writer was trying to say was that, again, God had fulfilled his purpose. This was part of God's promise. God had already promised David he was going to put a son on the throne that would build a temple, but God also promised that he would dwell among his people permanently when they got to the promised land. In fact, you might remember it when right after the Red Sea miracle, when Moses was singing the song of victory, that he said this in Exodus 15, 17, you will bring them into in and plant them on your own mountain, the place, O Lord, which you have made for your abode, the sanctuary, O Lord, which your hands have established. So again, this is affirming that very promise. God did bring them in, and now God is building a sanctuary on a mountain, and this happens to be Mount Zion, the place that God had appointed for the place of worship. 
So we look at this chronologically. We can look at it theologically. We can also look at this verse practically. You see, practically speaking, Solomon knew that it was God's time for that temple to be built. It was in God's redemptive plan and throughout redemptive history, at this particular moment, this was the right moment for this temple to be built. Now, how did Solomon know that? Well, part of being wise, and you remember Solomon was a man of great wisdom, is being able to discern the hand of providence, being able to see what God is doing through circumstances. I remember a lot of times when uh, Pastor Johnson would say something like this. He would say, we have to hit, uh, we have to hit the iron while it's hot. And uh, he would say that sometimes when we were getting ready to go into a project, and what he simply meant by that was, you know, the iron is hot, and that's discerning God's providence. The door is open. Things are ready. We better... Be ready to do what God is providentially guiding us to do. The Apostle Paul said it like this, For a great door and effectual is open unto me. So as believers, we have to discern that, the providential workings of God. And Solomon knew that God had set before him an open door. This was the time. He knew that the purpose was right. He knew that the time was right. Solomon's father, David, had made all the preparations. What were two, think about it like this. What were two of David's greatest sins? If you would say, well, that was probably his adultery with Bathsheba would be one, and taking a census of the people, that would be two. Those two things, and you would be right. And as a result of his numbering the people, David purchased property on Mount Moriah, where he built an altar and he worshiped the Lord. As a result of his sin with Bathsheba, he ended up marrying Bathsheba, and God gave them a son whose name is Solomon. So now we have Solomon building a temple on David's property on Mount Moriah. Think about that. God took the consequences of David's two worst sins, a piece of property and a son, and he built a temple. Where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. And David had made all the preparations for Solomon. He collected money in First Chronicles 22. He had a stewardship campaign where he collected the equivalent of $400 million in today's market. In First Chronicles 28, David gave Solomon the blueprints. Solomon made an alliance with Hiram, the king of Tyre. That means he had all of the materials. He had skilled laborers. At this particular time, there were no enemies coming against Israel. Israel was at perfect rest. This was the perfect time for this temple to be built because God providentially had controlled all of these circumstances, and God was now setting this opportunity before Solomon, and Solomon was able to discern this. This was the right thing for him to do. And this temple would be important for several reasons. First of all, all Israel would have a central place of worship. No longer would they be going to the high places where others worship pagan deities, Israel wouldn't be tempted to do that with a one central place to worship God. It would unify the nation of Israel to come and worship in this one place. God wanted a permanent place to dwell among his people. God didn't want to be any distant deity. God wanted to be always among his people. And God's name would be on that temple, that very spot. Up until this point in redemptive history, Israel was not associated with any particular place. God had manifested himself in a burning bush and a pillar of fire on top of a mountain in a tabernacle through an Ark of the Covenant. But now this would be the established place. This would be the place for the house of God. And then thirdly, God's glory would be on display for all to see. Everyone would see that glory. In fact, we'll get to it later, but in 1 Kings chapter 8, when the temple is dedicated, the glory of God just comes down on that thing so much so that the priests couldn't stand to minister in there. They had to get out because the glory was so great inside there. And that would be a place where God's glory would dwell, where God's name would be on that place. It would be a glory to the rest of the nations. It was more than just a building. It was a place where God would set his name, where God's glory would be seen. So, but again, let's get back to the principle. Get in harmony with the hand of providence. When God calls you to do something for him, when he gives you a special purpose, he will also guide you providentially. He will arrange the circumstances and the things that he wants you to do. Secondly, here's a second principle. 
Be committed to do the work with excellence. Be committed to do the work with excellence. When God calls you to do something, make sure that you do it right. Solomon would later write in Ecclesiastes 9.10, Whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with thy might. And this is what we see in this chapter. In verses 2 on down to verse 10, it kind of gives us the dimensions of this building, but it tells us it was made with the finest of limestone, prepared with the greatest of care. What I want you to see is look at verse number 7 of, of chapter 6. And the house, when it was in building, was built of stone, made ready before it was brought thither, so that there was neither hammer nor axe nor any tool of iron heard in the house while it was building. And this is amazing when you think about it, that when, they, when the stone cutters were shaping the stones and bringing them back and putting them in their particular place, they did all of that at the quarry where they cut the stones. And they did it with such perfection that when they brought the stones back to the temple to put the stones in, they simply slid the stones in place. There was no sound of an axe or a hammer or a chisel or anything like that. It was very quiet there because they were doing their work with incredible precision and incredible excellence. Dr. James Turner Barclay was a distinguished American scholar, and uh, he was in Jerusalem doing some work. This was back in 1854. And he was taking a walk outside the old city walls of Jerusalem with his son and with his dog. Suddenly, the dog was nowhere to be found. At the foot of the wall, his son noticed a deep, cistern, kind of a hole with a cavern there, and peering inside, his son heard the sound of distant barking. The dog had gone into this massive cavern that was there, and thus a dog is credited with one of Jerusalem's greatest archaeological discoveries. What did the dog discover? Well, there was a, a massive cavern there. In fact, the, the mouth of it, the doorway of it, was 754 feet long, over 330 feet wide, it was underneath the city of Jerusalem, the old city. It was between a place called Herod's Gate and the Damascus Gate. And you can still go there and see it today. In fact, I, when I was over there, I went inside this very, this, this very place. It's also called Zedekiah's Cave because Zedekiah the king had hid there one time when the Babylonians were uh, invading. It's also called Solomon's Quarry. And why is it called that? Because scholars believe this is the quarry that Solomon used to form the stones that would be used to build the temple. And if you go inside there and look around, there are obvious signs of quarrying on the sides and on the roof. And this was very practical because this cave would provide protection from the sun's scorching rays where they are working in the summer, also from the rainstorms in the winter, so they could continue working year-round. The cavern is relatively close to the temple mount. So carting the stones wouldn't be that far off. And the Bible says that Solomon used 80,000 hewers of stones. And they brought these great costly stones and they just slipped them into the right place when they were building that temple. Again, they did it with such perfection, with such precision. And, uh, and the quietness at the site of where the temple was being built spoke of the sacredness of this project the reverence of their purpose. And so it was appropriate for Solomon's workmen to do this work with reverence because they were doing a holy work for a holy God when they were building this temple. And this might also remind us of the way God works in our own life. You know, when God is working in us, he normally does it, he does it very quietly, doesn't he? doesn't he? It's the quiet, sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit that he does in our life. He does it in us quietly, he does it in us perfectly. He is working in us to make us what he wants us to be. But then if you look from verses 15 down to verse 35, and we don't have time to go over all these verses in detail, but let me just give you the summary. These verses describe the beauty and the, pres and the skilled work that went on, went on on the inside of the temple, in the interior, in the holy place. It was covered with cedar boards on the walls, pine boards on the floors. All of it was overlaid with gold. Notice verse 21 and verse 22, what it says. So Solomon overlaid the house within with pure gold, and he made a partition by the chains of gold before the oracle. The oracle is the holy place, or the holy of holies, we could say. 
and he overlaid it with gold, and the whole house he overlaid with gold until he had finished all the house, also the whole altar that was by the, the oracle, we could say the Holy of Holies, he overlaid with gold. And so uh, this, you can just imagine how beautiful this was on the inside. Uh, the interior, the holy place covered with gold. The Holy of Holies was a, a, a square room, 30-foot cube, we could say, symbolizing perfection. It also was overlaid with gold, and the total would be about 23 tons of gold that was used to overlay it. In verses 23 down to verse 28, this speaks of the cherubim, the two cherubim. They were 15 feet high, made of precious olive wood, overlaid with gold again. They had outstretched wings. In verses 31 down to verse 35, it speaks about the doors that were leading into the Holy of Holies. Again, that was made of olive wood. It was overlaid with gold. There was a curtain that hung on the inside of the Holy of Holies. And so the sum of it is this, that Solomon spared no expense to make sure that the house he was building for God's name was, was beautiful, that it truly honored the Lord. It was done with great quality. It was done with great skill. How does that speak to us today? Well, when we serve God and do his work, we should strive to do it with excellence. We should strive to do it with all of our skill. We should not give God our second best. We shouldn't serve him half-heartedly. We should give God our best. Don't give God your leftovers. Give God your very best. God is worthy of our best. And his glory should be reflected in everything we do. And this was certainly the case here with the, with the temple that Solomon had built. There's a famous story of the days when Sir Christopher Wren was building St. Paul's Cathedral in London. And on one occasion, he made a tour of the building site. And he saw one worker and he said, hey, what are you doing? And he said, well, I'm, I'm, I'm cutting this stone to a certain size and a certain shape so it'll fit. He came to a second man and he said, sir, what are you doing? He said, well, I'm, I'm earning money to... Uh, feed my family. And then he came to a third guy and said, what are you doing, sir? And the man kind of paused and he straightened up for a minute. He didn't know who this person was, but the man said, I'm helping Sir Christopher Wren build the great St. Paul's Cathedral for the glory of God. That's a different attitude altogether. And that's the attitude that we need as God's people. What we do, we do for the glory of God. And so therefore, it should express excellence in the way that we do it. Here's the third principle. Number one, I said, get in harmony with the hand of providence. Number two, be committed to do the work with excellence. And then number three, remember, there's no substitute for obedience. Now, back up in chapter six, I want you to look back to verse 11, because something very interesting happens during this whole thing. In verse 11 down to verse 13, this is a very interesting section here. Because chapter 6 is really a construction report about the building of the temple. But right in the middle of this report, God interrupts. He shows up right in the middle of this project. Uh, now, this is the second time that God will appear to Solomon. Now, God will appear to Solomon again a third time. But this is the second time that God appears. Now, we're not exactly sure how God appears to Solomon at this time, was it a prophet that came and gave him the word? Was it another dream like he had before when God promised him wisdom? Was this a vision during the day? Did God come in his Shekinah glory? These are questions that we have, and we're not going to have any answers to that. We're kind of left to wonder because the emphasis here is not on how God appeared, but the emphasis is on the message, what God had to say. This is what's important about this. Because look what God says in verse 11. And the word of the Lord came to Solomon, saying, Concerning this house which thou art in building, if thou wilt walk in my statutes and execute my judgments and keep all my commandments to walk in them, then will I perform my word with thee, which I spake unto David thy father. And I will dwell among the children of Israel and will not forsake my people Israel. Now, God wanted to make something very clear about this whole temple project. This was a magnificent project. It was done in order to honor his name. However, there would be no substitute for obedience. And God was reminding Solomon 
that he must, const- as he has to constantly remind us, that God is not impressed with our work if our walk is not in obedience to him. The things that we do for God are no substitute for our obedience to God. What God wants from us more than anything else is an obedient heart. You might say, well, I do all of this for God, and I do all of this, and I, yeah, but are you, do you have an obedient heart? Are you walking with God? Because that's what matters the most. No amount of money, no amount of time or effort or achievement can earn God's favor or be a substitute for just simply obeying him and simply doing his will from the heart. So Solomon must not trust the temple, but he has to trust God. You see, for Solomon, the temptation would be, you know, God, I built this great temple for you, and so therefore you should, you know, kind of give me a little slack, you know, in the way that I live. You know, I did all this work for you. That's not the way God operates. God will not overlook our disobedience. He will not overlook our indiscretions simply because we did some great things in the past. And, you know, this would be meaningful for later on in the nation of Israel because what you'll find as you come to the book of Jeremiah is that the people had made the temple an idol. They were thinking that they could live however they want and then come to the temple and worship God and get God's favor and expect everything to be all right. The temple had become an idol. And that's why Jeremiah in Jeremiah chapter 7 preached uh, his most famous sermon, which we, we, is called the temple sermon. When Jeremiah went to the temple and he preached against it, in fact, you want to look at that? Would you hold your place here? Go to Jeremiah chapter 7 real quick. Let me just show you a few verses here. And uh, notice what Jeremiah said in Jeremiah chapter 7. And look down in verse number, we'll start at verse 4. He's speaking there to the people of Israel, and he says, Trust ye not in lying words, saying, The temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord are these. For if ye thoroughly amend your ways and your doings, if you thoroughly execute judgment between the man and his neighbor, if you oppress not the stranger, the fatherless, the widow, and shed not innocent blood in this place, neither walk after other gods to your hurt, then will I cause you to dwell in this place, in the land, then, and that I give to your fathers forever and ever. And behold, ye trust in lying words that cannot profit. Will ye steal, murder, and commit adultery, and swear falsely, and burn incense unto Baal, and walk after other gods whom ye know not? And come and stand before me in this house, which is called by my name, and say, we are delivered to do all these abominations. You see, that was the mindset. We can just go and we don't have to live an obedient life. We'll do whatever we want. Then we can come to this house and everything will be all right. There are certain people that live that way now. They think, you know, as long as I come to God's house, you know, once a week, I'm okay. It's like, you know, it's a a get-out-of-jail-free card. You know, if we just come to God's house and tip our hat and, and uh, look, at, look what he says down here in verse 11. Is this house which is called by my name become a den of robbers in your eyes? Behold, even I have seen it, saith the Lord. And go ye now into my place which is Shiloh, in Shiloh, where I set my name at first, and see what I did to it for the wickedness of my people Israel. You see, before there was Jerusalem and the temple in Jerusalem, There was Shiloh, and the tabernacle was there at Shiloh. And for 300 and some odd years, the tabernacle was there. And that's where the people would go. That was the central place. But at the time when Jeremiah wrote this, Shiloh was completely destroyed. You know why? Because of the people's disobedience. And God said to the people there, if you don't think I'll tear down this house, then I invite you to go to Shiloh and look and see what you find there. I'll tear down this house just like I did Shiloh. And eventually God did tear down that house. The temple was destroyed, and it was because the temple became an idol. It became a substitute for obedience to God, and by that, the temple then became a, not a blessing, but a curse to the people. And again, the application is there is no substitute for continual obedience to God's word. There is no substitute for that. Not your work, not your giving, not your past accomplishments, not your religious performance, not your good deeds, not your good intentions, not your sacrifices. 
None of those things are a substitute for a heart of obedience to the Lord. Now, let me give you the last principle. First, I say, get in harmony with the hand of providence. Be committed to do the work with excellence. Remember that there is no substitute for obedience. And here's number four. Know that completing any God-given task requires perseverance. Look in verse 14, again, of chapter 6 in 1 Kings. And look at this verse. So Solomon built the house, and notice that next phrase, and finished it. He finished it. Go to uh, verse 37. Go to verse 37 and verse 38. And in the fourth year was the foundation of the house of the Lord laid, in the month Div, in the eleventh year of the month Bull, which is the, the eighth month, was the house finished throughout all the parts thereof. And according to all the fashion of it, so was he seven years in building it. The month Ziv is April in our calendar. The month Bull would be October. So if you put all this together, that means the temple was seven and a half years in building. And the the writer here kind of rounds it off to seven years. It took Solomon to build this house. And uh, you can imagine that there were challenges to this. There were obstacles in this. There was expenses to this. There was difficulties in this. But for seven years, he just continued on and continued on until he finished this this thing that he did for the glory of God. And, you know, a lot of times we have to understand that serving the Lord for his glory is just a matter of staying at it and staying faithful and plodding along and just continuing to obey the Lord and continuing to do what's right in his sight. And a lot of times on the road to serving him, it's going to get difficult. It's going to get hard. There's going to be challenges. There's going to be things that don't go our way. But you know what? We just serve the Lord anyway. We just finish what God called us to do. We finish well. And this is what Solomon does here. I think that when I think of this, I think of the, the great missionary William Carey. I read his biography one time. I was so caught up in that book. It was written by Timothy George, the Christian historian on the life of William Carey. It's one of the few books I, when I started reading, I didn't put it down until I finished it. I stayed up all night reading the whole book because I was captivated by the life of William Carey, the uh, missionary to India who went there in 1793 to preach the gospel. It was William Carey who said, expect great things from God, attempt great things for God. And when he arrived in India in 1793, he immediately began to just share the word of God with anybody that would listen. And, uh, but he was there for seven years without winning one convert to Christ. And sometimes he got discouraged, as anybody would, but he continued on, and he refused to give up. Finally, in 1800, he baptized his first convert. And right after that, two other men were baptized. And these three began to really throw themselves into the work of translating the entire New Testament into Bengali. Two years later, he was two books shy of translating the whole Old Testament into Bengali. And so here he was with these men that he had led to the Lord doing all this translation work. And on March 11, 1812, a fire destroyed uh, all of his notes, his manuscripts, his books, his, uh, his press, Everything that he'd been working for for 20 years went up in smoke. It's estimated to replace all that would cost about $50,000. Back in that time, that was kind of an unheard of sum. And so the translation work just stopped dead in its tracks at that time. It was a devastating loss. But when people in England heard about it, they began to collect money and they sent money over And long story short, the word had spread so far and wide that all these funds began to pour in, and pretty soon, Carey had more than he could could use, and people began to come and help him. And God took a bad situation, and he turned it out to be good. And and by the time of his death, Carey and his two friends, they started 26 churches, 126 schools, with a total enrollment of 10,000. They translated the scripture into 44 languages. They produced grammars, dictionaries. They organized a medical uh, mission. 
a bank, a seminary. And before William Carey died, someone asked him one time, they said, how were you able to do so much for God? And this is what he said. He said, I can plod. That was the secret. I can plod. I can persevere. He said, to this, I owe everything. I just stay on. I just stay faithful. I just plod on. That's the secret of it. And you know what? That's very true. In the Christian life, a lot of times, it's just being faithful. It's just plodding on. That's what it takes to do great things for the glory of God. So Solomon was able to build a house for God. And again, these four principles we can apply in our own life. So let me ask you, are you fulfilling the calling that God has for you? And do you do your work with excellence? Do you desire to please God in what you do? Now, let me just say this. You know, God is still building a house. He's not building a house of stone like he did in the Old Testament. The temple that God is building now in this age, in the New Testament, is not with stones, it's with souls. It's with people who are saved. The Bible says this in in 1 Peter, that the materials are souls, and that when people get saved, they're added to the temple of God. We are living stones added to God's building in a spiritual house. God is building a temple. God is building his church. And you know what? He wants all of us involved in that. That's why we have to be faithful to get the word of God out, to to share the gospel, because we are involving ourselves with God in building his spiritual house that we'll all be a part of. And by the way, let me also say that God is busy building you personally. He's building you spiritually. He's shaping you and the quarry of sanctification. He is using suffering. He's using temptation to chip away everything in our life that is unholy, to fashion us so that we'll fit in perfectly in that place that God has for us one day there in heaven. Billy Graham used to tell the story of a friend that he knew who uh, during the Depression lost everything, his job, his fortune, his home, but he held on to his faith. That was the only thing he had left. And one day he was walking down the street and he noticed some men were doing some stonework on a huge church. And so he said to one of the men that was chiseling this kind of triangular stone, he said, what are you doing with that? And the man said, I'm shaping this stone down here so I can fit it into that spot up there. And he pointed to a place up in the steeple area. And immediately the friend was touched by that. He saw what God was doing. God was shaping him down here to fit in that great temple up there. That's what God is doing with you. That's what God is doing with me because he's still building a house for his own glory, for his own name. Let's bow for prayer together tonight. And I want to ask you with your heads bowed and eyes closed, do you know that you are a living stone, that Jesus is your Savior, And that you're part of God's spiritual house. That's the most important thing to know, that you're saved, that you know Jesus Christ. And once you get that settled, the second question is, are you allowing God to shape and mold your life to make you more holy? Are you in submission to what he's doing in your life? And I would also just ask you, are you focused on fulfilling God's calling and purpose in your life? Are you listening to his hand of providence? Are you serving the Lord with excellence, obeying him from the heart and completing any task that he gives you for his glory? That's the call that God has for us now to do all of those things. Father, speak to our hearts. Thank you again for your word. Every part of it, every word of it is relevant for us. Many times people look at the Old Testament and can't seem to find things that are helpful for us today. But, Lord, we know that all Scripture is given by inspiration, and it's profitable. And in this story here of Solomon building a temple, we can see things that help us today, that we can apply in our own life, help us to be like Solomon in these areas, to serve you for your glory, to be concerned about your name and your honor 
And we pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen.